So in case you hadn't noticed, it's uh, summer, basically my favorite time of the year because I'm uh, unashamedly basically just focused on enjoying myself. Uh, but one of our highlights has been visiting some national forests and some state parks and enjoying nature and all that good stuff. Unfortunately, I've already made a video on like national parks and public parks in the ancient world. So today, what I guess we're gonna do is look at some like private um, menageries and parks and gardens, etc., cetera, uh, that were owned and operated by and for the wealthy. Although in a few cases, some of these might've been open to the public, at least partially as well. But today we're focusing on the glitz and the glamour and, and the high life. So let's get into it. So the trend of keeping like vast, luxurious, uh, beautiful gardens originated actually with the Persians. So the Persian kings and nobility would keep these really elaborate, huge uh, parks or gardens for themselves where they could invite all of their noble friends over to hang out and have parties and go hunting together. That was a big royal pastime was to go hunt foxes and stuff like that. Uh, and originally the Greeks and Romans kind of resisted this as like a royalty thing because they had a problem with kings. Uh, but over time, they kind of caved and uh, the rich and powerful started to adopt these, especially once uh, Greece and Rome get like kings and emperors. They definitely uh, pick up on that tradition. My favorite part of this list is probably the menageries or the collections of animals. So the Ptolemies, who were the Greek royal family in charge of Egypt, so Cleopatra is the most famous example. Uh, they famously had their museum with all of their works of literature and just general treasures and curiosities collected there. But a part of that museum was also a collection of animals, especially like rare and exotic animals, just because that shows off, you know, how intelligent and how powerful you are, that you can procure these animals from all over. Uh, and the Roman emperors also adopt this. They're big collectors of animals from across the known world, just to show off, just to flex really. Um, a lot of these animals they would have put into the gladiatorial games, of course, to be hunted, uh, but a lot of them they would keep in their private collections uh, either to hunt or just to look at. And I love the fact that there was a whole herd of elephants that was kept in Italy at this city, um, Ardea, uh, which was part of this uh, emperor menagerie. And the person who was in charge of this herd of elephants was called the procurator ad elephantos, which basically just means like the procurer and or carer for uh, the elephants, which I now realize is my new dream job. One of the most interesting examples of one of these private menageries was owned by this guy named Quintus Hortensius Fortalis, who was not an emperor or anything. He was just a Roman orator. And he was written about by the Roman author, Vero, and I'm gonna go ahead and read a quote uh, by this author. For there was a forest which covered, he said, more than 50 Ugra. It was enclosed with a wall and he called it not a warren, but a game preserve. In it was a high spot where was spread the table at which we were dining, to which he bade Orpheus, quote unquote, be called. When he, the Orpheus appeared with his robe and harp and was bidden to sing, he blew a horn. Whereupon there poured around us such a crowd of stags, boars, and other animals that it seemed to be no less attractive a sight than when the hunts of the Aediles take place in the Circus Maximus without the African beasts. So what's crazy is not the variety because he doesn't have animals from all over the place. He doesn't have anything from Africa or anything like that. But what is impressive is the pageantry. He's got all of these animals super well tamed to come to the calling of a horn. And it's not just that, you know, some random servant gets up and toots his little horn. It's that he has a guy who's specifically designated to like dress up and play Orpheus from the myth. And to play this beautiful music to summon all of these animals and he's got it all arranged so that it can happen when he has like all of his guests over for dinner so that he can impress them basically so just it's not just about the animals it's certainly not about like the scientific value of them uh, it's about the flexing of the the power and the wealth of course, there are more examples than I can count of beautiful gardens um, at different Roman palaces and mansions. Uh, if I had to give you just one example for this video, I 
would and I'm going to give you um, Hadrian's Villa and his gardens at Tivoli, uh, probably because those are the ones I've actually been to and walked around in and they were just gorgeous. So there's this gigantic um, pool or pond that's surrounded by these columns and statues and there's just this vast garden area that you can walk around in and you can imagine uh, the Emperor Hadrian walking around in and it's just really lovely and peaceful and I highly recommend it if you ever have, you know, some spare time uh, in Italy. So finally, I thought I would wrap up with a story that is just dripping in opulence, but also in humor. I think it's a very funny story. It's about Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, one of history's most infamous couples, partly infamous for the fact that they were just so opulent, just spending ridiculous amounts of money on feasts and parades and clothes and everything you could possibly spend money on, uh, but including their like leisure and recreation and outdoorsy time. So Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, they're hanging out, they're fishing presumably on the Nile, and Mark Anthony isn't catching anything and he's getting like kind of flustered about it because Cleopatra's right there watching and he feels like his masculinity is being threatened. So very pathetically, he uh, kind of pulls a slave aside and tells the slave to, you know, go a little ways away, get in the water, swim over under where his hook is at and attach fish to the hook so that Mark Anthony can pull up these amazing fish to impl impress uh, Cleopatra. And Cleopatra catches on pretty quickly because she's a smart cookie to what is happening, but she doesn't let Mark Anthony know that she knows. Instead, she goes around, she rags everybody about what an amazing fisherman Mark Anthony is and invites everybody to come with them the next day to watch him, basically. And he's all prepared to do the same trick again, but before his slave can get there, Cleopatra sends another slave sneakily to attach a fish to his line, but it's not just any fish, it is a salted pontic herring, which is a fish that A, should not be there in the Nile, and B, has been like salted and cooked and processed. So she's very obviously exposing the trick that's been going on. So he pulls up this salted fish and everybody has a really good laugh at him. I'm sure he was humiliated and furious. But to soften the blow, Cleopatra says the following. Imperator, hand over thy fishing rod to the fisherman. Your sport is the hunting of cities, realms, and continents. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope however you spend your summer, you have a great time, you get some time outdoors, whether that's at a park or a zoo or fishing or whatever your preference is, just have a lovely time. A uh, special thank you as always to Patreon members and to subscribers, and I hope to see all of you again next week. Carrot tip.